So this uh, this is shapes.io. This is late evening good enough shape factory. I am Van Velding, and this is the thing that I've been just throwing my time into. Like it is a volcano, and I'm making it offerings of the few transient moments I have on this planet. Um, I, I cannot... I've always known that games like Factorio would uh, draw me in, like like the video for Take On Me, but Factorio has a bit of a reputation, uh, and I didn't want to be drawn in and kneecapped by poorly moderated Leather Daddy Plumbers. Uh, but, you know, Steam sales, right? Shapes.io is not even the most Factorio-like game I acquisitioned during uh, Steam Sale 2021. Mindustry, you know, like like Mind plus Industry, Mindustry, by the creators of Shapes.io has all the uh, tight conveyor belt gameplay of Shapes.io, but adds Factorio's gun turrets and enemy waves. Um, in my notes for how I'm going to be doing these better, I'm going to add deliberate, deliberate for slowness. I tend to talk a little quickly and not enunciate. And that's it's a problem I am going to be consciously trying to fix from this point forward. You can see here I'm extracting all these little shapes and popping them into my hub, and it's telling me how many of them I got. That's progress, man. And these conveyor belts are so slow. They are way slower. Because you level up, things go faster. Here we go, level one, I unlocked cutters. And you get general levels that give you additional pieces of equipment. You also have level ups that make those pieces of equipment faster. It makes the extractors, which extract the natural resources of gray circles and gray shapes of other kinds, it extracts those a little more quickly. Conveyor belts can get leveled up and these cutters can get leveled up. There are all these little tools that do things to the shapes, have their own speed at which they function. And you can definitely have a situation where, yes, you go from extractor to cutter to dyer to stacker, but, because some of those tools work more slowly than others, they are actually holding up your line, so you need multiple ones in parallel. Um, right, but Mindustry, Mindustry. Uh, Mindustry is on a break ever since its structured challenge curve ramped from suicide bombers charging you with Pop Rocks technology to uh, Magic the Gathering ornithopters to actual soldiers to Mecha Godzilla and Heat. And its purest form of sexual satisfaction is treating my carefully constructed wall of genocide into a paper mache miniature. So, I'm playing Shapes.io currently. It is just the conveyor belt part, so I can focus on flow, efficiency, uh, and scale. You extract shapes, cut them, spin them around, color them with extracted dyes, stack them, and uh, then deliver them. The computer orders shapes and colors and configurations random enough that it must be drunkenly ordering it, ordering them from a play school catalog. And the faster you deliver teal half stars wearing green half circles like a lampshade, the faster your extractors, cutters, spinners, dyers, stackers, and conveyor belts work to deliver the next random demand, like uh, purple pinwheels on a white circle that make you double check that it's also not made by the same people who make Factorio. And you can see some of the other things that you need to uh, kind of... That, that's the other level up system there, where you can see it uses different shapes to level up the speed of individual components. The game itself is just jumping through hoops faster, so you can jump through the next hoop faster. I mean, like every game. Uh, it's got less insulation between that burning truth at its core and the shiny images that fool your brain into believing you've accomplished something in the last 20 hours. And I assure you, look at this, I will accomplish nothing in the face of these sheer cliffs of multicolored motherfucking procedurally generated cliffs. So, it is also not making those hoops come faster like a lot of games. I mean, seriously, Fallout 4. Fallout 4, I'm a level 105 rifle user. What biochemical and genetic alterations exactly do super mutant overlords have that make them so hardy that I need to unload dozens of shots to bring them down? By the time I am done at Big John Salvage, an invading party of goddamn Borg wouldn't assimilate these guys 
they would see how much of their bodies have already been replaced with lead and take them to a recycling center. But... Shapes.io. It is a stripped down experience with no nuance, but it has eaten up more of my time lately than looking for pictures of Adam Jakubowski. So there's something happening there. Maybe, maybe it's the eternal promise that'll make a more efficient pinwheel assembly plant instead of just copy pasting the last one. I mean, few games offer the opportunity to dream of accomplishments so fantastic. It also mostly lacks an economy. I mean, you can't give a player an infinite white space of procedurally generated shapes and colors and then declare the existence of a conveyor belt cartel who has looked at my paltry production of red stars on yellow circles on red pinwheels and declined to extend a new line of credit for a dye mixing center. I get it. I mean, since every game is putting on fewer airs than a shirtless scene in a Thor movie, <laughs> I mean, okay, probably making fewer airs too, but you know, if, if you get what I mean, it can't add some kind of narrative element. That everything is kind of arbitrary is a strength, but it's also a weakness. Like, why is the only currency the type of shape, you know, you know, the type of shape that I store and then spin to copy groups of structures? Uh, why is that shape a white circle and a blue teardrop? Do certain colors or basic shapes correspond to improvements in cutting or conveyor belts or stacking speeds? No, they don't. And it, it does irk me a little bit. I know all video games erect artificial challenges to pushing one button that plays a message of validation before the credits. See the Stanley Parable. Um, I mean it. Look at the Stanley Parable. You'll probably get that lesson out of it. Um, I didn't because I finished it in five minutes and understood instantly that playing it again would be a mock rebellion against a fake explicit authority while obeying a developer's implicit demand you play again to complete a pretendy rebel run, or as I call it, the Britta Perry parable. Uh, could we just say that green and by extension yellow dyes improve conveyor belts or something while stars improve cutters? Like maybe take the bold narrative approach to have things mean stuff? <sighs> Shapes.io demonstrate... Let me see what the level up is. Oh, I leveled up... Um, there we go. Extractor speed is up by from 1 to 150%. Amazing upgrade. Now I need those those uh, corner pizzas. And it's not just any corner pizza. It's not. It's it's specifically top right, and i got to get those, those cut together. Uh, Shapes.io demonstrates perfectly... Both why elements analogous to the real world are important in games, and how quickly a game would slide off your brain if it truly, as many wish, liked any political or social dimensions to the game itself. I, I should be careful, though. Every crafting game I have ever played has arbitrarily analogized those real world elements into basically interchangeable parts. Uh, Minecraft's Mad King declarations, like how armor stands can be made with the stone melted from stone melted from cobble and nothing else, because it, it alone possesses the presumed quality of armor standiness, that uh, quartz, prismarine, diorite, blackstone, sandstone, instone, uh, and deep slate all lack. I mean, Perhaps it's best that I asked relative babe shapes.io not to venture into those woods. It's not immune to the arbitrary game design wolves that live there and clearly kill for sport. I mean, Minecraft. Look, look, come on, Minecraft. I Cobblestone, iron, gold, and diamond are all equally valid crafting materials for tools. Is Steve an earthbender? Can he chisel diamonds with his adamantium dick? Can Al... Uh, okay, um, moving on. I, I am almost done with shapes.io because since writing my first draft of this script, I have learned it has been mauled by an arbitrary game design wool. Just one of the more patient asshole ones called sizing. When you stack one shape on top of another shape, the one shape gets slightly smaller. Naturally, if you stack a whole shape on top of a half shape, like, say, one of the four-pointed stars uses a half circle as a cape, the whole star gets smaller, uh, but the half circle remains full size. Yeah, that's, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. What some country fry bullshit is, is if you cut off the legs of that star, perhaps in search of a 
Bad taste shape you want to name Christopher Reeve, you monster. The legs of that bisected star grow back to full size. This is not intuitive at all, and isn't consistent with any logic except the logic of the devs discovering a bug and testing, but believing then it could be written off as a gameplay challenge. I also take some, some exception to wiring suddenly being a thing. The quad cutter works well enough to cut a full shape into its consistent quadrants, but if I want to apply paint with the same logic, like the Homer Simpson makeup shotgun of a very simple conveyor belt game, suddenly we have to start running wires? That's just a bitch, though. The game's thesis is that adding efficiency adds complexity, and it is fun to navigate that and learn those rules. I only bring it up to put a pause between my two runs at this sizing bullshit. Okay, so now I need overlapping tabs to stack pieces down to size and then cut and re refuse them because heaven forfend I make a small piece and it stays small. Was that a really big ask, guys? Is there some bizarro paradigm that I'm not aware of? Was a development done during the weekend of Tumblr's infinite chocolate apocalypse? Whatever. Its days are numbered, and I'm going to see if I will have any better luck making a wall of, of uh, mecha magic fingers in Mindustry. So what, so what I really wanted to talk about today, though, um, instead of just bitching about this game and letting those of you who follow me on Twitter and who are tired of hearing me talk about how much of my time it's taking up, um, what I really want to talk about were, were three things. Morning Perfect Base, the Trek Along Podcasts, and the last tournament. So first, Morning Perfect Base. Actually, first, Loki. I am, I am not that interested in Loki as a character. I, I understand what the numbers look like, guys. If you're a little shocked by that, I get it. I have a Tumblr. I'm a younger sibling who values cleverness and intrigue. I have an older brother who tries to keep the world turning the way he expects with force and who then wallpapers pithy aphorisms over that force, you know, when it's all said and done. There is clearly a connection there. I get it. But I'm not that interested in Loki. I mean, sure, that story had some depth, but it's done. The logo for the Loki miniseries drew me in. That snarky graphic design is my passion critiques. Pretty clearly missed that discordant elements can be used to create an intentional effect. That's fucking graphic design. As a general note, any criticism couched in a cultural meme deserves a sneer and measured Sims-like relationship debuff. Everything from show don't tell to communism is great in theory, but... You know what movie told like hell? The Princess Bride. You know what movie has held up the best over the past 40 years? Die Hard. But right after that, Princess Bride. The Loki logo was chaotic, it was uncomfortable, and I was intrigued. I was intrigued at a Marvel thing being uncomfortable. Intentionally uncomfortable, not the, the Black Widow, Bruce Banner thing that happened in Age of Ultron. Jesus. If, if anything tells us that our timeline isn't sacred, it's that that happened. My error was assuming, uh, spoilers for the Loki miniseries, assuming we'd have... Uh, one establishing episode with our premise, one to two episodes with our new status quo that weave threads for the big action bullshit story in the past three or four episodes, and all that while Loki faces externalized versions of his own flaws and becomes the best version of himself, not necessarily a good guy, before Jean-Luc Picard unplugs him from the PS2 and he gently fades away with a proper goodbye. And for the record, I did actually expect... A copy of Lo of a beloved character with a narratively unsatisfying death to get euthanized by Jean-Luc Picard by unplugging their memory card in the Disney Plus series Loki. Because that happened in Star Trek Picard for no reason, and now I expect it anywhere. It wouldn't make any sense, and it doesn't add to the story, but uh, it never did, so why would it not be everywhere? And some of those things happen. Check Patrick Stewart's IMDb if you're really curious. But it's big action bullshit story from the jump. Loki has to face his shortcomings in episode 1 by watching an MCU box set that's lying around. And he doesn't become the best version of Loki. He just sheds his Lokiness and bleak gorgs into a generic Marvel protagonist. He even sports some modern Western Civ Earth moral qualms at the end. 
I can't even root for him. The MCU routinely turns a billionaire genius, the uh, final word in steroid abuse backed by the U.S. military, and the green Karen into scrappy underdogs. So we both agree that as Guardian Prince Ice Giant Magician with an army and an infinity stone is a character that needs humbling. And it's fun and unsurprising that the Loki series starts by humbling the ever-loving shit out of Loki. That's good. I love it. It makes him face up to his failures, lack of vision, and, and the failures and lack of vision of the past and those to come. I mean, for him at least. That's great. But what it doesn't do is demonstrate what makes Loki uh, this Loki, because we have a lot of Lokis from different timelines in this story. This Loki is a Loki from a different timeline. Uh, what makes this Loki special? Or... Uh, or different, or likable, or unique. This story focuses on this Loki because he's a generic Loki. He's unremarkable, or, if I'm being nice, remarkable in how crappy he is. Let me give you an example. Loki is the god of mischief. So in the Time Variance Authority, aka the TVA, keepers of a single sacred timeline, who prune deviant timelines and the variant individuals who made the decisions that caused those deviations. You with me? When the TVA abduct and humble the variant Loki created in Avengers Endgame and then recruit him because another Loki is humbling the shit out of the TVA by murdering whole squads of their jackbooted thugs, we realize right quick that the Loki getting manhandled by the jackbooted thugs sucks ass compared to the Loki who's playing games of Scrabble with only letters found in the names of the three last murder victims just to keep things interesting. Okay, the Loki that we're following isn't a badass. They're not super tough. They're not on top of things. They have no idea what's going on. So then you would expect, wow, this is a long and unfocused example, uh, when you would instead expect uh, a layered intrigue. I mean, everyone acts like Loki is a genius manipulator, deceiver, and genius, right? After two or three uh, pointless lies and jerk-arounds that had no conceivable payoff, I realized this Loki, and the Loki we had come to know from Do Thor Dark World, from Dor Thark World? <laughs> from Thor Dark World to Infinity War wasn't any of those things at all. He just lied a bit and then betrayed people. Uh, a one backstab Marin Heat, if you will. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. And sometimes you think he's somewhere, but then uh, he's somewhere else. God of mischief, everyone. So, Han I mean, Hannibal Lecter could do that, right? And Hannibal Lecter didn't even know how to cast Cantrip. And I guess also he's Loki's dad. I don't, I don't have a clever joke for that. So, Oh, oh, uh, there was also this one time where he surrendered to the Avengers, and everybody knew it was weird, so they sent in Black Widow to outwit him, and hey, look, no shame there. That's like her core competency, so no, no shame on Loki for that one. Uh, but it was all part of a convoluted plan to get Fury to collect Earth's mightiest heroes, acquaint them with one another, and then assume they'd chill around the Mind Stone for long enough that... I guess they fight each other to the death of Xanatos Gambit. It was not. I am also 0% sure what his plan for that nuke was. Anyway, Loki's wit is that he lies a lot. And when he's captured by people who've seen his entire lifetime and a few thousand variations on that theme, that power is as gone as his magic is. And his character never grows in a way that replaces that. He tries to bone a woman, but that's not really a character arc. I'm, I'm sorry, Hollywood writers. That when a man has sex with a woman, that, that's not a character arc. Um, uh, he starts he starts incompetent and flawed, and uh, he ends up incompetent and bland. You know, BoJack Horseman had five fucking seasons, real seasons, not a mini series, of BoJack fighting his asshole nature and failing. And us watching him and, and 
fail, watching him fail and hurt himself and hurt other people. And I can't speak for everyone, but we rooted for him anyway. It was rough, but in the end, actually, I don't know how it ends. I still haven't gotten the gumption together uh, to watch season six yet. Now, look, Casey at the TVA can have a desk drawer full of Infinity Stones, but Marvel will never have enough stones to do something that can stand within viewing distance of Bojack Horseman's shadow. I scripted this, and it was deliberate. That was supposed to read, you know, Casey at the TVA can have a desk drawer full of Infinity Gems, but Marvel will never have enough stones to do something that can stand, etc., etc. And I, I still blew it. It was very conscious. It's, it's it's a choice of words to kind of like show contrast. I think it worked better with the stones, though, to be honest. You know, because you're hammering it in. They got stones, but not stones. Regardless, uh, instead of tapering tapering off on a off the cuff digression, improvisation there. Uh, look, you're you're thinking to yourself, "Hey, Van Velding, you sound a little angry. Someone would compare Loki to Bojack Horseman, but you're the one who did that." My point is. Okay, Loki can do a little of that, just a souciance of giving into his nature despite knowing better, because he is a character with weaknesses, and we grit our teeth as we empathize with him, dealing with the consequences of those weaknesses. We all do that, you know, that's, that's a human thing. You, you sympathize with characters who do human things, right? Or, what if we gave Loki a problem to solve that only Loki could solve. Not because he's good at hand-to-hand -hand combat or able to learn enchanting, but because his character, his experiences, and the way he sees the world around him is different from that of uh, Captain America or Scott Lang. All of the promise of intrigue in Loki boils down to the few hundred billion times a Loki or a TVA agent says to a TVA agent or a Loki, hey, let's uh, give this dolphin funny Jerry Lewis teeth. And then the other person says, bullshit, giving a dolphin funny Jerry Lewis teeth is just another way for you to trick me. And then the first person says, hey, trust me. And and, and whether anyone trusts anyone or, or who gets betrayed is determined by whether there's any logical alternatives to giving dolphins access to prop comedy of that magnitude, or whether the other decision would just stop the plot. Like, like that's how it works. We just we just go through this this cycle, and and no one no one learns anything, and just Loki becomes friend friends with um, Owen Wilson, which is great. Like I'm glad they're bros. I like that people like each other, and and they hug. It makes my heart warm. Owen Wilson radiates this natural positivity that is impossible to unlike. You know, I get it. But wh while I'm on the, the, the bitchy role, like in a big picture sense, Loki is basically an Asgardian, and he has regular martial arts fight scenes with armored dudes. And at one point, and I am not exaggerating for comedic effect, okay? He gets his ass kicked by a refugee from peopleofwalmart.com. Actually, I am exaggerating a little bit there for comedic effect, but it is a 300-pound shopper at a department store. One is Loki, who showed he is he who should be at least as fit as in-game's Depression Thor, and the other is, at best, in a bulking cycle, are one of those healthy people who carries a lot of fat, but I am willing to bet that that dude's only roid rage was probably caused by misplacing their hemorrhoid donut. Remember the guy who no look caught one of Hawkeye's arrows? I remember that guy. It exploded, granted, but like, let, let's not let's not like forget that. Look, if I fight a Taekwondo championship and he fucking kicks me and I can't move out of the way of it, but then like I explode into dust, okay, he fucking still kicked the shit out of me, but I I just had a plan. I mean, sure. Props to me for playing on him being a badass, but imagine that your plan starts with, I'm going to shoot an arrow, and this guy, he's not looking at me, but I am like 70% sure he's going to catch this arrow. Uh, and like the whole time you're looking, 
he, he he's not seeing the arrow. It's, and and then and you're like, oh damn, this isn't gonna work. And then he he boom, he just catches you like, oh well, fuck me. I'm glad I put a delayed uh, time explosive arrow in there. And then it explodes. You're like, yes, oh god. But uh, oh, also remember, same movie five minutes ago for Loki. You know, uh, nine years ago for us, nine days ago for Loki. Um, there's Captain America, and I like Cap. But this is the guy who served Steve Rogers a pipe and platter of America's ass. Remember that? Uh, Captain America is just putting his heart and dancing to it. And he looks like Star Wars kid because Loki's like, mm, nothing personnel kid. And then Iron Man shows up and Loki's like, oh, God, this would just be tedious. And so he fake surrenders. Um, it, it's a little, you hate to see it is, is what you hate to see. But um, look, I would not give a shit. If the character arc or or the story broke into the low Bs grade-wise, but it is, this really seems um, appropriately average. Uh, it gets a C. It 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 barely breaks the mid Cs, really, and and that's why and that's why it's so notable. How disappointing it is! Spoilers as we dive a bit deeper, but. When we get to the end of time, but not really, it's more like just before the end of time, and we see a league of less conventional Lokis surviving the Langoliers, I really like how the more conventional Lokis are shown to be myopic to the point of self-destruction, something our Loki is spared by dint of the fact that they pal around with the least conventional Loki of all, and that they got to binge watch phase one, phases one, two, and three on the TVA's Disney Plus account. But then we have the romance, which is as stupid as it is heterosexual. Loki's romance is apparently so powerful, so chaotic, that it forks the timeline in the most unforkable place in the timeline. We establish it. It is a plot point. And, and there, there is no hand-holding, there is no making out, and there is no ass-up or guardian fucking that is going to deflect a falling moon. Even Old Testament Yahweh wouldn't descend from the heavens and halt a falling goddamn satellite just to shame the self cess because he is a god with an actual defined character and it's not the type that says no to apocalyptic disasters. Trust me, I've been through the book. Uh, that's not his style. I mean, look, maybe it's not a big deal, though. I mean, Iron Man survived a falling moon come Mass Driver. Moon? Moon Driver? In Infinity War. So maybe, maybe Marvel superheroes can just ignore apocalyptic events uh, with a decent role on a con save. I quit reading the comics because, as events, physical, personal, and social, kept growing in scope with no greater consequences for the characters who had to deal with it all, uh, I was just exhausted. That's why I stuck with smaller titles. and, um, You know, like the smaller titles that held fewer pretensions to cosmic relevance. I was hoping Loki would act as one of those quote-unquote smaller titles. But it clearly fucking didn't. I mean, look, I, I knew there would be cosmic revelations for the Marvel Cinematic Universe metaplot in there. Like, I knew that was going to happen. But you don't need to be pretentious with that. Okay, may, maybe when I say it out loud, that sounds a little stupid and naive. Um, may, uh, maybe this is where I scale back my already scaled back Marvel Cinematic Universe interest. To get back on track... I am not a fan of unexceptional people driving plots because it feeds the ubiquitous social delusion of people thinking they're the main character of the real goddamn world. I am not a fan of the power of ineffable qualities like love or pathos or determination to stop threats that are well established in a story. Once you allow that, any rule or paradigm or consequence in your story can be ignored if the audience has enough feels, or if you... The writer, the hack writer, thinks that they have created enough feels. Once the writers think they have written a scene so impactful that you will accept it as a get out of corner I've written myself into card and reward themselves with vicarious romance and a wink, then nothing matters. Once you let somebody's strong feelings override consequences that you have set up as part of like an uncaring physical universe, then, then, then none of it matters. The consequences are obviously fake, and and not just fake for real, but you feel it in the real world. But you feel it within the fictional world. 
you you have have removed the the fakey pretend look i have a script i'm going to get back on my script if scarlet witch is sad enough maybe thanos's heart will just explode i mean why not right who gives a fuck if we can take your emotional investment and use it to spackle our shitty plot I'm going to take your existing passion for a piece of media and feed it to you so you ignore the obvious flaws in my movie, political opinion, show, or internet video. <clears throat> Look, maybe fuck me. I coined the phrase 300-year-old glasses, which accepts that little incongruous parts of a story aren't important if your audience is engaged. It's a, so it's a good paradigm, and not just because it lets me be petty as fuck about Star Trek Picards. Um, I mean, uh, this TV shows I really don't like. I, speaking of petty, when Kid Loki gives Loki a short sword or long dagger or whatever, and Loki creates a scabbard on his back for it, okay, fine, cool. So was the scabbard real? If so, why could Loki not just make a long dagger the same way he made a scabbard? Look, I get that the scabbard has an important, nay, critical function if you have an appreciation for the male form, specifically Tom Hiddleston's male form. Keeping it is a given, don't get me wrong. But this appreciation is not so strong that I won't adjust my genes and ask some piercing questions. Hey, look, here's one. If the TVA uses reset bombs, they're not called reset bombs, but I don't remember and don't give enough fucks to look it up, to reset the area affected by variant activity, then, okay, let's keep going with that. And, a, okay, look, a variant, just to recap, is the individual who, by dint of free will, has unwittingly made a decision which causes a divergence from the one true pairing uh, sacred timeline which the TVA must destroy. I mean, they have to destroy the variant timeline, they have to protect the sacred timeline. You get this. So the TVA deletes everything affected by the variant with reset bombs, including people to, I guess, reintegrate that alternate timeline with the main timeline by removing what makes it unique, then um, why don't they just leave the variants to get deleted by the reset bomb? I mean, look, if you delete 100 cubic meters of Mongolian desert because it's infected with events that should not have happened, then that crater has to diverge as well. Unless that gap is filled in with the land and people from the original timeline, as you have deleted the parts that are different, right? So why not leave the variant to be deleted alongside everything else? I mean, the right person would replace them the same way the right everything else would replace everything else that was deleted. I, I Tell me if I sound crazy here. Why a trial system? Why the bureaucracy? Why um, look your murder victims in the eye? I'm not saying it's the right choice. I'm saying that right was never part of the TVA's rubric. Speaking of that, third and final spoiler warning. The TVA doesn't actually delete everything. They send it to the end of time, but not really. It's more like just before the end of time. Instead, where the Langoliers eat it. Okay, Langolier. Okay, actually not literally a Langolier. Let me remove the first word of it and replace it with an A to give a more accurate impression of it. Angolier. Uh, so, right. Second question. In New York 2012, Iron Man from 2023 gets bodied by the Hulk from 2012. He drops the Tesseract, a.k.a. the Space Stone. Loki from 2012 picks it up and escapes to Mongolia. Sequence breaking the universe. Well... The sacred timeline. He won't sequence break the whole fucking universe for another six episodes. So the TVA shows up, captures him, and drops reality bleach on the scene in Mongolia. But I'm not going to get into Steve Rogers' return trip at the end of Endgame to return the time and Mind Stones to 2012 if someone performed a standard timeline reset on what was already a divergent timeline that maybe should have been, you know, reaching that big red critical line, or maybe returning the stone. Well, Steve didn't return. Well, he returned the other two stones. So, um, so maybe returning the stones to where they belong actually curved those timelines back down into the sacred time, the main timeline. I don't, it's not the, the sacred timeline because they created pocket divergent timelines that are okay. The TVA is like, no, 
what the Avengers did was part of the plan, so that's cool. So it's a non-sacred timeline timeline, which briefly existed and was reintegrated into the main timeline. Allegedly, I mean, just, just it, this isn't explicitly said, I'm just kind of imagining, when Steve goes back and replaces those stones, the timeline goes bloop all the same. Um, I don't know what happens with the Tesseract. Presumably, it, it's part of the normalness of everything else that gets reasserted over the approved variant timeline when the reality bleach destroys that look i'm i'm gonna go back to my script here so look so maybe whereas variant timelines that are bad will divert from the main timeline they'll they'll, they'll veer up and they go ooh, and then the tva has a little thing where there's a red line it's like oh no it's veering up to the red line once it does that it's it's critical we're, we're on a timeline to like bleach this hole before we poor choice of words this is why you write scripts fellas and we're, we're on a, a deadline to bleach this thing before this timeline hits the red line and it makes too many variant timelines it branches itself and there's too many of them for like one strike team to just bleach it so we got to nip this thing in the butt and they call it pruning and it's a good analogy so right so we accept that some changes to the timeline are unconsequential. Like, I assume a second Steve Rogers with a shield where both were fated to lie low and not affect history. You know, like like old Loki. And at the end of the timeline, um, we meet an old Loki who's like, no, I totally, I totally faked my death in Infinity War. Um, and then I hid on a planet for centuries. Um, which the TVA didn't care about. As far as everybody knew, Loki was dead which means the timeline's fine, and if there's a Loki living somewhere secluded in the timeline, not doing anything important, then um, the TVA doesn't care. But as soon as he tries to leave that planet and leave that seclusion, that isolation, TVA fucking gets alarms and shit, and they gotta go there and they gotta prune the old guy. Which, fine, reasonable. I mean, that the same thing could happen with Steve Rogers in Endgame. This is not a bit, this is me kind of explaining how the rules of time travel in the TVA, as explained in the Loki miniseries, actually kind of do make sense for the um, the Steve Rogers that we see at the end of Endgame. Given that Cap would want to maintain his timeline, and he would lose exactly zero powers by being captured by the TVA, like if they show up and they're like, come with us, and they're trying to blah, blah, and he'd be like, I'm fucking Captain America. And then um, they would take him in and put a little collar on me, like, no, I'm, I'm still fucking Captain America. Um... Anyway, um, he might have been one hell of an independent contractor for the TVA from 1945, 1949 on, which would have given him a damn good reason to keep his mouth shut in 2023. So I guess I did kind of get into that after all. Um, that is actually an interesting possibility introduced by the series, which I'm mostly just bitching about. Um, so were there two teams... To cover Loki's actions in 2012, kind of getting back into that. One in Mongolia and then one in New York. Did a TVA brute squad open a portal in the lobby of Stark Tower, go sicko mode on the Avengers, and delete slash reset slash Engelirify everything? I mean, now that I think about it, there is actually a Stark Tower in the end of time, but not really. It's more like just before the end of time. Or did they just bleach the whole planet? Which um, is interesting because whenever they bleach places, all of it goes to the end of time, but not really. It's more like just before the end of time. And they're like, oh yeah, you can't just delete that kind of matter from the universe. Oh, oh, we, do, do we do we care? Do we care, uh, Disney Plus miniseries Loki, about conservation of matter now? Is that a big deal? Because um, I, I seem to remember that um, the entire premise of you existing is that sometimes if Loki picks up a shiny rock, then... Um, an entirely new universe is created, which um, I don't have a calculator on me, consists of a shit zillion tons of matter uh, that just spontaneously boops into existence. But um, you can't deboop it um, unless you send it to the Angleers. So are you fucking sure about that? You just magically create the matter, but only sometimes. Only in emergencies, I guess. Oh, fucking. God damn, where's my fucking. No, it's here. Wasn't Heimdall watching from Asgard? I mean, 
given how many Lokis that they adjustment bureau to hell and back, it seems likely there's always a B team of jackbooted TVA goons prepared to fight and delete Heimdall in case he's watching Loki at that moment. Like a, like an H team just for Heimdall or, or, or preparation. Eh. Look, I, I am nitpicking again. Um, how about this? Let's nitpick something different. In a series predicated on free will, it turns out in the end that free will is actually bullshit. <laughs> None of it matters at all. Um, it's all completely 100% predictable. The two most chaotic entities in the galaxy team together to do some murder. Okay. And then a the guy's like, no, 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 no. I, I know how this is going to end. I know this is going to play out. I know every step of this conversation. It's like, wait, wait, what? What? Like, what does any of this mean? Like, what, what's the significance of any of this? I mean, are the TVA kidnappings and show trials and... Well, right, they're not mass executions. People aren't executed. They're just put in a dying world of detritus where they're constantly preyed upon by the nothing from the never-ending story because I'm tired of the Engelier's joke. Mass glugged? So maybe they did that to people who make wrong decisions because eventually... Two Lokis need to be kidnapped, show trialed, mass gulagged in order to engage in an elaborate play with predictable ending whose suspense we maintain because knowing the perfectly knowable ending would be boring or some shit. Or hey, maybe our main antagonist is just the 112th insane Marvel protagonist because that's what we need. But it doesn't matter. I mean, none of this matters, right? Like, the two options we're given are actually one... Okay, all right, well, actually, okay. Undoubtedly, okay, undoubtedly, there is going to be uh, a simplistic, easy-to-swallow, just-go-with-it solution at the end of Phase 4, some kind of moral yogurt solution. But the two solutions Loki's... Loki's... The Loki's are given to either plunge the universe into chaos as Kang the Conqueror deals with a Rick and Morty style Asimov cascade, Google it, which can only be ended by the TVA throwing people into the time gulag, or Loki and Loki 2, you pick which one is Sylvie, run the TVA and become morally responsible for throwing people into the time gulag. Hey, and maybe we're a bit full circle as Sylvie, who seemed like a Loki without the short-sightedness and mistrust endemic to Lokis, chooses the Asimov Cascade in a fit of short-sightedness and mistrust. She shatters the sacred timeline into a... Uh, my notes here say uh, Multiverse of Madness, I'm told it's called. I, I just don't feel that, though. And the romance between Loki and Sylvie is just uh, the rote heroic story vagina as a cherry on top. It's it's definitely tofu with cherry flavoring. It is a hollower version of a standard Marvel story, and I expected anything but that from a Loki miniseries. It's not bad. It's just that I, I it's aggressively mediocre, which is the last thing I expected. It's clever in that respect, I guess. So now that that's off my chest, let's talk about Morning Perfect Base. I feel like... I feel like I've been on a hedonistic slide lately. I have been concerned ever since I got a, a financially stable 9 to 5. I'm, I'm restarting the clown and pony show of getting a therapist. Maybe that'll help. I mean, look, the one absolute answer is just doing the work. But I spent... Eight hours, eight hours yesterday rewriting this script. Um, so it's it's really hard to say do the work when, whenever the, the work is usually so much more than I anticipate. But um, but that is the only cure. I thought I was being clever when I chose to make a few morning perfect bases about our aborted Star Trek role playing game. I ran with the fate system. I had a season. Sorry, I had a season with an anticipated six sessions per season planned out. Generally planned. Um, we ran four sessions. <laughs> so when, when you add player characters in, 
and then throw in a vague overarching plot, there's a lot of easy content to talk about, right? Then, then I thought to myself, what if I, um, you know, not completed it, but took my notes and story ideas and PC character arcs and just storyboarded it, right? Just, just made the story board. That is harmless, right? And you know, unless the two month gap in Morning Perfect base installments has physically harmed anyone, that was a technically correct thought. The best kind of correct? Usually yes, but here, uh, no. I had an end point that I wanted to get to and a file of notes that I wanted to be done with. Morning Perfect base is a way for me to process things. Usually news, but old projects are fair game. It wasn't all planned from the start because player characters do what player characters do. You plan short-term in contingencies and long-term in broad strokes and consequences. So the final write-up will make assumptions about uh, broad player decisions when we get to it. So after two months, what do I have? I have a finished first draft, one without um, any uh, levity, not even self-deprecation, you know, like this uh, finished script, but a complete draft. Um, you know, many pages, enough enough pages for seven seasons. I got universe beats, right? Character progression, the climax of the run where player characters know the universe and other characters well enough to set their own agendas and plot their own course. But how long is it? What I think is worth mentioning is how much it has in common with Enterprise One, the Star Trek fan fiction project I did, did with Dr. Izix, where everyone from the original series to Voyager was alive and on Kirk's Enterprise. The uh, story breaks with me and Dr. Izix are on his YouTube channel. Um, those are in about an hour or so. And the five minute reviews for like pretendy episodes are on my YouTube channel. I had a lot of fun making those. <clears throat> you know, they're worth checking out. It's like five minutes. Um, an RPG is about letting people make choices, whereas a script needs characters to make specific choices to convey a message, right? Nonetheless, the elements of Trek are still there in both projects. So in the end, um, the, the role-playing game, the Star Trek Fate role-playing game, ran about 40 episodes and some total pages of, um, you know, Morning Perfect based episodes, when I write them in, in my notebook here, physically, um, usually I try to migrate them onto my Google Drive and then I, I do a text-to-speech, do a little editing, boom, boom, boom. I don't have to fight with my own handwriting. I can easily insert little last-minute thoughts. It's very clear. Every stumble I've had in the script has been because of my handwriting. Um, having looks like having sometimes, and, and that's, that's just my handwriting. Oh, yeah, you got to put the other way. There you go. Um, so, but basically, like, the rough draft script is, um, is about 12 to 15 pages in, in, I think, these nine by six and a half notebooks that I have, uh, double spaced, in a 180 page notebook, which I got in bulk from Amazon and thought, I'm never going to use all these, which I'm now halfway through the supply of, in a 180 page notebook, the rough script ran two of five sections. And plus two pages. So when you do the math on that, it's uh, 74 pages, single space. Um, and it's less rough script than a uh, storyboard, broad storyboard. Um, it's five to six episodes. And I mean five to six episodes because when you round between 12 to 15 pages per episode, um, that actually produces whole episodes depending on how you nudge those uh, apart. Punching up and turning retroactive margin notes into full storyboards is going to add a bit. I have not worked on this uh, scale, so I, I don't know how it's going to affect things. I might cut some stuff? No, I'm not going to. This isn't a rant about the Joker movie. Like, there's no self-indulgent digression to remove. It is all focused on the campaign. Um, options, world elements, um, story messages, and hooks are all non-optional, and, and they're just barely written down. They're just skeletal. Hey, here's a note. You need a ship to be the, um, what's the other kid from Harry Potter who's not Harry Potter, but who also could have been, like, the prophecy to kill Voldemort applied to him, too, because Voldemort kills his parents or some shit. I don't know. 
Um, on the subject of self-indulgent digressions and lazy setups for smooth transitions, trek along. The Beige and the Bold has one season left. It is going to finish with guest co-hosts. If you are interested, um, email me at vanbelding at gmail.com or comment below this video and I will get with you. As for the next generation movies, I don't know. Nine Deeps of Space just wrapped its second season, which was a reprise of Deep Space Nine's first season with uh, the new co-host, Kit. I don't know if we're doing season three right now. Kit's great. They add perspective. Uh, perspective I don't have, and that is 90% of the reason I looked for a new co-host to replace Derek. But it turns out that um, lots of Trek Along was about watching Star Trek with a friend. I like Kit, and we get along, but there is like 20 years of difference between those two seasons of Nine Deeps of Space. No matter how well we click, it's it's not the same. I, I don't know that a dozen or so people or bots, you know, I don't know how invested the people who do listen to this are. Um, I don't even know if they're people. Maybe they're Russian bots. Russian bots have been long-standing supporters of me. So have a lot of people. They've been long-standing people who've, who've liked what I've done. Um, so I don't want to quit. But it's become more of a chore to make. I, have n I haven't been happy with how I've been making Nine Deeps of Space and The Beige and the Bold lately. I've been late. Episodes have been half edited. Uh, my my audio quality and enunciation aren't good enough. I'm still using filler words like crazy way too much for someone who's supposed to be uh, seven years into a project like this at this point. 17 to 1, the podcast for the original series, it started with some pretty shit quality, and I got better as we moved into the beige in the boat, uh, the beige in the bold. But I've plateaued since then. Still randomly can't pronounce the word bold sometimes, but I, I'd like to be proud of what I make. Um, and some of that comes from breaking the cycle of it's shit, so I don't want to commit, and I'm not committed, so it's shit. This is the third time recording this. Usually it's once. Occasionally it's twice, and then, uh, and then I'll just ship it, you know? Like, that's, that is not a bad way to do things. But if you're going to do things that way, there needs to be continuity. I need to ship it knowing it's bad and then turn around immediately and take that knowledge right to the next one. I can't ship it and then ship something else two weeks or three weeks or two months later with a blank slate when I'm going into it. Also, the audio quality for Morning Perfect Bass is bad. There's a lot of variance in volume, so I can't make the baseline quiet stuff louder without peaking the other parts of it. I could cut the peaks and boost the quiet parts but that's labor intensive and it boosts audio problems too quiet to normally be apparent. Also mouth noises. And let me quote John Oliver by asking, how is this still a thing? How am I still making mouth noises after seven years? It's nuts. A professional would record paragraphs separately, but I record all at once to better sync the audio with uh, the video components. And, and this applies to both the podcasts that people are watching simultaneously and morning perfect bass. I could sync in post, maybe crossfade to blend sections with different audio levels. You know, you record for two or three hours and you're going to have different intensity for different parts. You're going to get, I'm, I get tired. My throat is, is, I've been projecting like I'm supposed to for this recording session and my throat is sore now because people are like, oh, why do you always speak so quietly? Because it physically hurts. <laughs> It physically hurts for me to speak loudly for a long period of time. Um, and if I record multiple takes of different things, I'm going to have a different uh, kind, kind of a different attack at the end of that than I do at the beginning. I'm going to have to crossfade. I'm going to have to have, okay, well, this is kind of like, you need to adjust the audio levels. And now I have slightly elevated audio to slightly lower audio. It's going to jump a little bit when you hear it. So what I need to do is peak one down and peak one up, and then I'll, ooh, blah, 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 and it'll kind of meet in the middle. Hypothetically, I've read about it, okay? I've, I've Believe it or not, I've done research into this. Um, so, like, look at, look at, when I talk about labor, 
look at the five minute reviews of Enterprise One, which are still available on my YouTube channel, right? Really fun and really, really short. Scripting was quick, quicker than it should have been, to be honest. But recording was slow. Each episode took an hour and a half. Multiply by three for a 15 minute morning perfect base. Uh, multiply by 15 for a 45 minute Star Trek podcast. That is a lot of time. So nine deeps of space. What what are my options? You know, like what are what plans can I have in no particular order? So um, uh, option alpha, stopping. I could just stop making it. I mean, it'll clear up my schedule. I don't know what more worthy thing I would be doing with that time, but I could just stop doing it. Uh, option beta, I could do the same thing but different. This is the option I like the least. I am very, very hesitant to stop it cold turkey, but like, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd get some free time. I could play some Battletech, my friends. I could play some shapes.io. Um, but I, I'd hate to do it. I would hate to do the same thing, but different. You know, oh, let's make another oath to do better that rings hollower in each supplemental in each season. It, it drives me nuts to, to do that plan again, but this time different. This time it'll work. Uh, op option Gamma. I could give it to Kit if Kit wanted it, you know? Um, maybe, maybe she has a friend who, who she'd like to watch it with. Maybe it sounds like fun for, for them. I don't know. Um, option Delta. Do solo sessions. I do not like this because, as I said before, um, solo sessions mean I have to keep talking for 45 minutes, which means I'd need a script, probably multiple takes. It would physically hurt uh, even if I did all of that, I would lose the spark that an outside perspective brings. I mean, maybe I could solicit questions from Trek fans who haven't seen Deep Space Nine. Like, go to the, the Star Trek subreddit for Discovery and be like, Hey, you, you guys, do you want to watch an episode of Deep Space Nine cold and then ask me about it if you haven't seen it yet? And they'd be like, yeah, that sounds like a completely reasonable thing to do. Um, that seems nuts. Op option Epsilon, the moonshot. I can combine Morning Perfect Base, Nine Deeps of Space, and make a scripted watch along with current events which complement the episode's message or history. I'm already getting more explicitly into politics and current events in the Trek Along podcast anyway, and, you know, I've misstepped a few times from lack of research. So that dovetails pretty nicely, um, the two of them. Then the video component of Minecraft is just slapped on top when it's published to YouTube. Um, I wouldn't be a huge fan of that, but, you know, it might be okay. I'm, I'm not going to do it, but you can you can actually store GIFs of whole movies in Minecraft painting files. You know, I don't, I don't think YouTube's content detection would work for a compressed GIF of Star Trek Deep Space Nine I occasionally glance at while doing Minecraft stuff. Um, and yes, that's too far. That's so much work. <laughs> That is so much work. I, you know, let me know. Let me know. I do this for me, but I know other people care. Um, the other series post Deep Space Nine, um, maybe I should sit down and sketch that out because I've had this plan on paper for a long time, actually. The plan is, um, is I'm going to watch Deep Space Nine front to back, whole nine yards. I wanted to share it with Derek and I don't, you know, a lot of what I did while we watched the original series, while we watched The Beige and the Bold, was prepping for things in Deep Space Nine. Just kind of seeding little story elements. The Breen, fleet sizes, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And to say, oh, yeah, no, look, here's Kor, Kang, and Koloth. Like, th those are guys from the original series. Remember that? And sure, Derek would be like, yeah, I think so. But it's different, Okay. <laughs> Um, the goal is always to do a holistic um, view of things, to watch how things interact. Maybe that's not so important, you know? I mean, I don't watch... I, I, ne I haven't watched all of Voyager. I haven't watched all of Enterprise. And I don't intend to watch all of Enterprise. I don't intend to watch... This is my save game, by the way, my, my current save game. You can see how very, very different... How much it grows, you know? How we have grown from... The very simplistic stuff I was doing on that new world to the um, 
conveyor belt Looney Tunes music that's that's happening here. It's great. I love it. You see these these those bands are colors because it's just it, it seemed very sensible to me to run colors around things. Those big uh, uh, lines around the hub though those are the highways into the hub. I don't have to connect things into the hub anymore. I just have to connect it to one of those freeways. And you can see down south, I haven't really made that freeway because all this this stuff is still doing work and I can't rip it up even though it's it's paused. And this happens periodically where something gets paused. See, the, the, these conveyor belts aren't moving out, which means one part of one of these conveyor belts isn't getting supplies. Um, I think it's this. No. Come here, yellow. This, all right, this, this isn't getting a piece. This, this yellow bit, there's, I'm supposed to be stacking something on the yellow bit. So i got to trace this conveyor belt back to this dyer. So the stars are getting there, but there's no color that's getting there. And that color is going to be it's probably white. White. There you can see. So what it is, there's, there's just occasionally a little white that comes down here. Probably feeding multiple systems. And then you can see there's really sparse white compared to the colors to the right of it. Really sparse white coming on this line. This is actual white production. I did it in line. Um, kind of pulling from the other colors that were coming down. Um, let me see, more white. Conveyor belt. This white's traveling <laughs> halfway around. Um, yeah, that's more dying. And, and this is set up so that, um, that that white is backed up. So the other white's routing around it. So this is, this is addition, additional white production. It's pretty slim on yellow. That's kind of bad. And then this blue doesn't, oh. I need to reroute that. Okay. I put those tunnels in the blue and I broke the lines. And I never routed the, the conveyor belt around it. So look, what am I doing? The plane for Voyager was, and th these are spiraling out. So they had different, this not, I don't have to make highways from the colors out. I just have to manage the colors as they go. Um, they just managed to periodically raise into a higher orbital. So the plane was for Voyager, um, to do the trial of Catherine Janeway. Watch Voyager, pin down the story points of Voyager. Bam, this story has relevance for the future. This story has relevance for the future. You know, when Seven of Nine comes on board, when Kess leaves, you know, um, there are events that, you know, really are put down stakes for the series. But then everything else, because Voyager was so determined to be episodic, I was going to watch it in random order. Pilot, Random episode, random episode, random episode till we hit the next story point. And then watch the story point, and then bam, random episodes from that suit. Random ep episodes between those two story points, randomized all the way to the end. Um, and to back that up, a sub-theme would be, who the fuck is Captain Janeway? What logic is she working on? Has she broken any laws? I know there is actually, on the internet, the trial of Captain Janeway. Um where a bunch of nerds are so angry at Captain Janeway they put her on trial for shit. They never did that that fucking shit for Ben Sisko. Ben Sisko, what did some war crimes? Uh, no offense, he if you're going to put Starfleet captains on trial, uh, you should you should probably put Ben Sisko on trial. I love the guy. He's great. But, uh, yeah, he would done some stuff. Him and Janeway both. And, you know, I've implied in the Beige and the Bold that Picard has actually reported and then been held to account for the things he's done. Um, classic episode. I'm, I'm really, I'm really going to script here. Classic episode, which is, uh, the name of it is really the drumhead, where, um, you know, the Admiral comes aboard. She's like, you've, you've done all this stuff, Picard. You're unreliable. And it's like, Starfleet knows he did all this stuff. He must have had a board of inquiry. They must have asked him about it. Um, if they haven't, they should have done that, though. If Picard has been not been held to account for any of the things he's done, violated Prime Directive, lapses in security, so many lapses in security. Watch the first two seasons of The Beige and the Bold. He has real problems in terms of training his crew in season two. Um, in seasons one and two, people could have died. People might have died. I don't remember right offhand. Uh, Kirk is... Kirk goes to trial. Kirk is some of the least outside of the box workings of any of these captains. And also, Kirk's biggest crime was stealing the Enterprise. And he fought. He saved Earth, okay? Jim Kirk saved Earth so that he could fucking stand trial on it. I know I go on about this all the time. But I just, I don't, <laughs> it's wild. 
Anyway, all these motherfuckers need trials. But what I would like to do is honestly start with the assumption that there is a contiguous character of, of Catherine Janeway and to figure out who that is. And if she really broke any laws, maybe she doesn't. I, I've also wanted to take um, the character of Keiko and critically analyze the accusations uh, against her of the fandom, of being all of these bad things that Keiko O'Brien is accused of being. And I don't think she is. I think a lot of that is unearned. Um, we're still getting into it. So we got two or three seasons where they're trying to use Keiko to, to go into. Um, I'd love to have a less traditionally masculine perspective on that. But um, the trial of Captain Janeway, Enterprise I'm not interested in watching. Um, I will think up some shitty hook. Well, my shitty hook is that I'm going to sing fucking talking shit about Enterprise over the credits every single time. If you want to hear me bitch about my throat now, wait until you hear me goddamn sing. The tables will be turned. The throat will hurt you. Um, but I, I don't know what the hook for that would be other than just making a drinking game of every time I fucking hate Enterprise while I'm watching Enterprise. Uh, and then, of course, the 2009 movies, kind of watching with neutrality. I would be watching um, Into Darkness for the first time. I still have not seen Star Trek Into Darkness. I don't know that I've seen any of those movies more than once, to be honest. And then, of course, I would, I would do other episodes of Her Name is Michael, Get Over It, which is for Star Trek Discovery. And I might, I might continue doing... Oh, yeah, I do. You guys voted. Um, voted to continue Pop of a Card, Captain of the Subscription Service Enterprise. Um, whenever that comes out. And I'm just going to watch Lower Decks and enjoy it. Fuck y'all. Lower Decks is fun. I like Star Trek. I like Lower Decks. It is a good goddamn time. Not great, but above average. Better than fucking Loki. Um, let's see here. Um... Oh, yeah, finally, on page 1 million, Zebra Ink Cartridge number 3 and take 5, probably by the time you're hearing it, the last tournament. So, as you know, um, I have been leaving Magic the Gathering. I still play with friends and using one of, like, six decks for the Commander format, which is the only format our friends play now. One reason I'm quitting is because Wizards of the Coast have modeled the Magic story on comic book stories, and somehow, like... We're all trying to find the guy who did this, okay? The magic story has become a quagmire of overlapping characters, eternal cliffhangers, contradictory canon, failed payoffs that can't afford to make substantive changes to the status quo, and just go with it logic that trades consistency for hollow climaxes, and it's still completely disconnected from the card game it is trying to sell. Two family members hugged after decades of estrangement. That event was immortalized on a spell that lets you discard a card to draw two cards. Look, when I say when I see my family, I do think I'd like different options right now, please. But that's not the feeling I got reading that scene. Read it yourself. If I like it, uh, ask me. I'll fucking shoot you the link to the story. Look, man, just accept whatever happens. Turn off your brain and enjoy people who are resembling some cards you own. Is bad storytelling. So, as a way to say goodbye to a game I genuinely loved, I am making the last few decks I always wanted to make. Uh, I'm putting all my decks into a tournament, and I am writing the story of that tournament. Not every battle, but for a few. It's it's regular fiction writing project number 1000, and if I finish it, it will be the third or fourth successful one. I am trying to focus my apprehension on the assumption that I will be sacrificing quality to crank out regular content. Maybe I'm going to focus on making something more publicly appealing compared to what I usually make, which is usually for me first, and then I just try to make it so that I'm not bored when I listen to it again. Um, part of that is researching oral storytelling tutorials, um, not role-playing game storytelling, like cavemen gathered around a campfire storytelling, Homer storytelling, uh, C-3PO with Ewoks on the forest moon of Endor storytelling, and it'll be incorporated into morning perfect base like most of my projects, you know, I like to work that in, it's always fresh content, um, and if I research what goes into the morning perfect base, then I'm making something better, and I'm also researching the project. Um, that I'm working on. Oh, also, the end of the Captain format. That one's coming up. Um, that'll be one, because that's that's over. I think officially. Um, I did a poll on the Magic subreddit for thoughts about the current fiction and thoughts on fan fiction. That was a whole that was a whole thing. And, and that, that's worth going over, the story of it. Um, and the results of me trying to interpret that. Also, I want to make sleeves with hot dudes. 
Um, but I don't want to be tasteless, so I've made a poll bracket with polls on my Twitter, at Van Velding, where you can vote on the pictures of the dudes uh, if you have Twitter. Um, the two winners will get, um, you know, 100 custom sleeves printed, and then I'll have some hot guy sleeves that hopefully won't be trashy, you know, or offensive to my fellow players. Um, so that that is the state of the shit. Um, been playing this game a lot. Been playing Minecraft a little bit. You can see all the things I've upgraded here. Um, you can see that that freestanding slightly smaller shape. That's that's why I'm not going to play the game anymore. Look at that bitch. Look at him. Look at him. what a bitch. Fucking hate that dude. He's the worst. Anyway, um, thank you for listening. Thank you for bearing with me for this big gap and this incredibly long episode and all of my digressions from the script, which. Um, I think helped me violate every one of the three simple principles of having better delivery in these episodes. <laughs> um, again, Loki is just so mediocre. Like, if you just love Marvel stuff, I think you would like it. That's not an insult. That's just like, hey, I, I'm picky. If you haven't picked that up, I'm a picky person. Um, and I really wanted a little bit more from Loki with, like, common little brother energy. Is Loki the younger brother? I mean, he was adopted. Oh my god, I can just imagine seeing like Kid Thor, and and Frigg Frigg comes in, and she's like, "Oh, this is your younger brother." He's like, "What? What? The horses when they get pregnant, they have to care." She's like, "No, no, no, we're gods. We um, a stork brought it, and then then later in Thor, and Thor's like, Loki was adopted. I thought the stork. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. My parents lied to me." It was one of those moments for Thor. That'd be great. But anyway, that is all I got. Um, keep learning, keep asking questions, and keep making good art. Um, that's all I can tell you, and I'll see you next time.